Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Kimball Santa. I cover the house for the Arizona Capital Times. Uh, here in our most recent installment in our uh, Zoom Q&A series, we're with Representative Noel Campbell, served in the legislature, I think now since 2015, uh, and is uh, stepping down after uh, the conclusion of this session, or I guess which already has concluded. Uh, chairman of the House Transportation Committee, a uh, staunch advocate for the gas tax, despite the uh, best interests of his party at times, uh, <laughs> and uh, an all-around interesting guy. Uh, I kind of wanted to get him here to talk to us a little bit about his legislative uh, tenure and his sort of aspirations and, and thoughts on the House. Um, just, just to kind of get started, um, for folks who are not maybe familiar with you, if you could just you know, sort of give a, a brief summary of your recent life history and kind of how you got to the legislature. Because as far as I know, this is your first elected position, right? So you had something had to break in you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, first of all, I grew up in Phoenix and I uh, went to St. Mary's High School and graduated from Arizona State. I spent a year in Mexico as a foreign exchange student and I learned to speak pretty good Spanish and um, came back and uh, the Vietnam War was heated up and I had to go into service. So uh, I chose to go in the Navy and go, went into pilot training and became a Navy pilot. Uh, I served in Vietnam for a year in uh, the Mekong Delta flying helicopter gunships with a Navy unit. Came back, uh, my contract was five years, uh, did some more uh, Navy stuff on the West Coast and then got out and uh, was offered a job by the U.S. Customs Service um, on the Mexican border. So for 27 years that I worked uh, all up and down the line from San Isidro, Calexico, El Paso, Albuquerque. And then I did foreign operations where I worked in uh, Central and South America for 10 years. And then um, at age 57, retired and then um, just started firefighting, uh, flying uh, helicopter tankers and fixed wing aircraft on fires for 10 years. So after that, I actually, um, somewhere in between on the firefighting, I woke up one day and I said, you know, I want to run for office because uh, as a federal law enforcement officer, I'd been precluded from taking active part in any political uh, issues. Uh, but I decided that uh, I was a good citizen and I cared about the, the state and the country. And I thought, well, well, you know, one of the things I learned about in the military is that you, you, nobody is better than you. you. You know, you learn to deal with people on an as come basis and you're not intimidated by them or the process. So that's a good quality to have for run for politics because you, you can get discouraged very easy because, you know, you're so worried about whether people like you or not, or, you know, so anyway, I decided to run and I ran uh, twice. Uh, I lost the first two times and uh, decided uh, that I was, you know, I'd given it my best shot. It was not going to happen. And then, the, the third time I ran, uh, a candidate from um, came up from Phoenix that had already served 16 years in the legislature and was going to continue um, their career up here for another 16 more, I guess. And that really bothered me. I think you serve your community and go home. Um, you know, it's, politics shouldn't be a career. And, and uh, I want to, I want to, if I can interrupt you, I kind of want to touch on that subject because I, you and I have talked about that concept before and talking about why you're you're, you're stepping back. What what is uh, the sort of background or root of your kind of contempt for this, this careerism and, and, and why, why you have this ideology that you should serve your time and then, and then go home? Where does that come from? Well, yeah, it has to do with uh, when you get in there and you think this is your career, then what happens next is you've got to figure out how do I stay in office? And that means you have to behold yourself out to special interest or uh, money interests that are going to support your campaign re-elections. And so the whole purpose then becomes to stay in reelected. And, uh, you know, you, you can't really do the things that you really want to do because you're afraid you'll offend somebody and they won't support your campaign for re-election. It's a vicious cycle. And I've, I've seen it uh, in the legislature where th these, these people come in and they, uh, that's all they want to do is get re-elected. And it's a, it's a tough process because it happens every two years. So uh, I don't think it's a good system. I really think that the legislature should be elected for four years and um, and then uh, you know, gives them more time to actually work on the issues that they that they care about. But uh, I just think that the, our system was never designed to have uh, these these elected positions be a career position. We see in our federal Congress they they get benefits, they uh, they can retire, they get they get a a lot of money to serve. And the average person doesn't is not part of that. 
And I just think it doesn't serve our, our country well. And I don't think it serves our democracy well when you have people that just want to stay elected. And, uh, you know, there's other things in life. I think uh, anybody who goes into politics should have a prior life and have a life to go back to. And, and that's how I feel about that. Did, did, did you feel that there was a risk that if you, because you had two more years that you could have wrote, wrote out before your term limit, you know, presumably right. and then you got reelected. What, was there a fear? Do you feel that you would have been susceptible to undue influence from outside influence had you, uh, from outside, you know, moneyed interests, as you said, had you stayed longer? No, I, I, I didn't feel that way. I, I left because um, I was frustrated in not being able to accomplish the, the things that I really cared about. And I was able to accomplish some things for my community that were very important. But the major thing is I was the chairman of a committee, the Transportation Committee, which is, should be one of the most important committees in the state of Arizona, but it's not. <laughs> it's because it's my own party didn't, didn't believe in what I believed in, and, uh, which was um, I truly believe that uh, the state is so far behind in its function of maintaining and constructing new roads and safety for our highways. Uh, and we've talked about that before, you know, it takes money to do that and you just cannot uh, continue to ignore that fact. And, uh, and all the contractors and all the citizens from the League of Cities and Towns and Chamber of Commerce, they all understood that. And the County Board of Su uh, Supervisors Association, they understood that and they supported me. But where I didn't get any support was from my own members. Uh, who were afraid of the tax word because they were running for office and this constant trying to appease people but to support them. Uh, they know that it was the right thing to do. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I had conversations with my members. Yeah, we know, but uh, we can't uh, be for raising taxes. Well, uh, then, then I, I didn't get any support from our leadership on it until this year, which unfortunately was a failure because of the coronavirus. And I never got any support from the governor at all on this. And uh, I'm sorry, I mean, it's not a personal thing. Uh, I like the governor personally. I like my leadership personally. It's just a, it's a policy issue that uh, I felt so strongly about that I thought, hey, I'm, I can't get anything accomplished here. And I don't see it happening uh, for the, in the next two years. And plus, I'm ready running out of gas a little bit. You know, I'm up there. I'll be 79 here in December. And I thought, well, I've given my best bet and uh, it's time to let somebody else try or step in. So that, that it had to do with, uh, I know I could have gotten reelected. I mean, actually, I think I was the largest vote getter in the state in the last general election. But of course, I live in a heavily Republican area up here too. So. Right. Um, it, it, it's, do you think that the governor kind of put you in a bind when at his state of the state speech, you know, he kind of echoed sentiments of, of prominent Republicans past and said, no, you know, basically no new taxes this no. year. Yeah, I think that's a mistake. I mean, you know, we're not, I don't, I never felt I was down there to just to hoe uh, the party line. I mean, which is a no new taxes. Hey, I look at the, at each case and I, I thought, Hey, this is a real need for this state and it'll pay benefits to this state. You know, it's well known. Uh, for many uh, people that deal in transportation issues, that uh, for every buck you stick into a dollar of transportation funding is going to get you about a three dollar economic uh, return. Um, transportation is the 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 lifeblood of this state. We we have to have it to make our economy happen. And uh, you know, I just came back from um, California a couple of days ago, and I rode on. I was on Highway Interstate 40. Oh, God. That thing is, when the Arizona line up there at Needles, when you cross into Arizona, it is terrible. Pothole. We don't have the money to maintain that highway. That's a federal interstate highway that's our responsibility to maintain. The federal government built them, but we maintain them. Couldn't do it. And it's terrible shape. And, you know, your teeth rattle when you're on that interstate. Mm -hmm. And that's so typical of all the roads that we have in Arizona, the rural roads, they're really uh, the crying need for that. So I, I, you know, I did the best I could do. We, we had hearings, we had, we had support, but we didn't have the critical support we needed. And then of course this year, when it all started to come together, I thought uh, to gel uh, with my leadership pretty much on board, um, I thought if I could get the bill out of the house and up on the governor's desk, that he'd have a hard time vetoing. I, you know, you, you, you have to look at the bill for its merits and then 
you know, the governor, I'm sure he wants to do the right thing for the state of Arizona. And, and I think he realizes uh, that, hey, that the, if the legislature and the people support this, then he would too. And, and, but it didn't, it didn't happen because of the coronavirus shutdown. Right. So I, I talked about this issue of, you know, initially not getting support from your own party. And, you know, in, on issues like this, you've kind of developed I guess a reputation that I, certainly I furthered and that, and that others in the legislature I think are aware of as someone who is a bit, you know, goes against the grain as maybe more conciliatory or pragmatic than, than some of the other Republicans mm -hmm. in the legislature. But, you know, ultimately you've, um, you know, been in line with the party on probably most major sure. votes, I would yeah. say, and, and even on votes to, you know, kill your own projects like the highway safety fee. So I'm, I'm sort of just wondering from your perspective, you know, what it is about you that, that has created this sort of reputation and whether you think it's fair or whether you think it's mostly just sort of aesthetics or, or, or optics? No, I think I'm, I'm, um, I'm think I'm a person that wants to cooperate and get things done. I mean, I can go down there to, to just be down there. I mean, <laughs> I went down there to sure uh, help my district and I did. And I also wanted to help the state of Arizona and, and in that capacity, I was assigned the committee and transportation. I was a, with com transportation every year I was in the house and I went all over the state. It, this isn't something that just, you know, came off the top of my head. I mean, going around the whole state of Arizona and hearing the same thing over and over and over again, uh, you know, it, it has to happen and it will happen someday. Uh, maybe not in the next two years, but, uh, people realize that this is a necessary thing. I mean, you know, the government, the government only has to essentially do three things they're mandated and that's public safety, public education and transportation. Th those come from the earliest days of our country. So. Uh, and in Arizona, we've struggled to do all three. <laughs> yeah, well, we do. And, uh, you know, priorities have to be set and, um, but, I, you know, I, I, I really I think our, our caucus, our leadership, our party is in serious trouble. Um, I, I certainly I didn't want to, that was one of the things I thought about, which was I didn't want to serve in the minority down there. I, I would be totally useless and really frustrated um, if, the, uh, if the Democrat uh, party takes over the House, which is a real possibility. I mean, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it can happen, and in, in my opinion, it's more likely to happen than not. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but um, I know that the, the, the Democrats will look at transportation issues differently than our, our Republican caucus did. Uh, they realize that uh, when we spend money on transportation, we create jobs all over the state, especially in the rural areas. And, uh, you know, and they're good paying jobs, and they're skilled jobs, and everybody uh, will benefit from it. It's it's a win-win proposition. It's just getting past this mantra of no new taxes. I'm not for taxes that are wasted. I'm not for taxes that are redundant. I, I mean, I look at every issue spending. Even in the Department of Transportation, there's there's waste and uh, fat in there that can be looked at and should be looked at. Uh, normally, the governor just sends us down his budget and we rubber stamp it. Well, that, that can't happen anymore. Uh, every department head uh, in the legislature has got to look at the departments they're, they're working with and for and determine uh, how, to, how to make it more efficient. And, uh, but I, I really believe that, um, you know, somebody else can do it. I mean, I'm not, there's nothing extraordinary about me. I just have a different attitude. Maybe it's because I'm older and I've had a work career in, in many fields. Uh, I've worked in foreign countries. I mean, I have a different perspective about it. And... Uh, and, 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 and it's, it's perspective that extends beyond just the gas tax, right? I mean, I, as I remember, I think you were probably going to be a no vote on the on the sanctuary city ballot referral. Um, you know, so it, it's it's more than just this one policy area. Is, is there something that kind of shapes this this broadened worldview of yours? Is it the military? Well, you know, I I will say this. I I don't know if that's that's true or not. Let me just say, as far as sanctuary cities, I I oppose that. I. I mean, I worked on the border for 27 years. I mean, we, we have to have, uh, secure our borders. We have to have an immigration policy uh, that, that is upheld legally. And, you know, I'm opposed to limited illegal immigration. Uh, no. Um, but as far as working across the aisle, 
uh, on water issues. I, I was probably the only Republican member down there. I would attend the water meetings that were held about the policy of water in Arizona. It's a critical issue. We have two water laws. It's confusing. We have like 60,000 claim cases that have never been adjudicated. And we just never get anything going on this. So I worked across the aisle on water issues. I went against my own leadership on, on water bills. Uh, I was not a member of the Natural Resources Committee. I wanted to be, but they wouldn't let me anywhere near that. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, th that's the right thing to do for Arizona. Um, uh, I'm for, uh, I consider myself, if say, well, Mr. Campbell, what, what kind of Republican are you? Well, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. I believe in conserving our, our natural beauty and our resources. Um, up here in the Prescott area, we have the, the Dells, this beautiful rock formation. We, we would try to make a regional park and we're finding all kind of resistance about that. Why we can't do that. It's all about money and it's, but you know, I, I would be so happy if we can get this uh, regional park set up because we, we have parts of it that are in operation now and 100,000 people a year come up to, to use our Peavine Trail in the, in the proposed park. So um, yeah, I, I, I wanna get something done for the betterment of my community and the state. And if that means working across the aisles, they want to call me a moderate or what the hell, I don't care. So that's a beautiful thing. When you're not worried about getting reelected, you don't care what they say about you. You just go ahead and try to do the right thing. Yeah. So, so one last question before I, I let you go. We just talked a little bit about uh, you know, the possibility or even the probability that Democrats uh, end up in the majority in, in the House next year. If that's the case, is there any sort of um, wisdom or guidance that you would impart unto them that, you know, that you gain from seeing how the Republicans treat the Democrats. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. yeah. First of all, when I first went down there uh, six years ago, um, they treated the Democrat minority terribly. I mean, they, they didn't have to be so vindictive and so mean spirited about, you know, it, it, it's them versus us, this kind of thing. And when I went down there, I was kind of shocked by it all. I, I thought, my God, I mean, and now today we see it's even worse uh, nationally and, and at probably at the state level. Um, I would just say to my uh, Democrat colleagues that, look, um, be magnanimous. I mean, uh, don't, don't make the mistakes that we made and, and try, to, try to rise above it. I mean, we're going to have policy differences on education and water. We're going to have all kinds of differences, but keeping a civil spirit of, of openness. And I try tried to do that with all the members. Uh, I, um, I had a good rapport with those members. Um, they knew that I respected them. They respected me. Um, I was the only Republican member that would go to the secular conference. The secular meeting was once a week. And they dealt with all these, you know, hot button issues, uh, abortion, uh, you know, well, equal rights amendment. And I wanted to go in there and learn what is that they're talking about. And I, I found it to be very fascinating. And they, they were very kind to me to let me come in and talk. And I expressed my views, you know, about education and why schools, uh, failing schools need to really be shut down or, or, or vastly improved and how to do it. We have different ideas about that. So there can be a lot of work done. I think that it all depends really on the Speaker of the House, uh, who that person is and what their attitude is. Uh, I know um, uh, Speaker Mesnard was, uh, was was much more open than Speaker Gowan. And I think Speaker Bowers, I really don't know because he, he didn't communicate with the caucus very well. Yeah. So we never knew what he was really thinking or doing. It was just, and this was another very sore issue with the legislature. The legislators, the Republicans, felt like they were just pushed out of the room while our leadership dealt with the governor. And that's not how it should be. Um, governor Ducey didn't do himself any favors by bypassing the Republican members. There's a lot of hard feelings there. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know how that's going to interplay next year, or, or the next uh, session that comes up. Yeah, great. Be a factor. All right, Representative, thank you so much for taking the time. This is fascinating. Okay. And uh, we'll see you soon. I hope so, Aaron. And, and one other thing, I'm, I'm, I'm just because I, sure. I dropped out uh, after six years doesn't mean that I've lost interest in politics. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that if I think that I could do something back down at the Capitol, that I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, age is not a factor for me. I mean, as long as my health's good, uh, I just thought it was the right time to step back and, uh, and, and let somebody else take, take uh, the issues. But 
Um, I'm going to keep my finger close to the ground. I'm working on local issues here, and I'm going to stay involved as long as I live. So, Great. All right. Well, then maybe we will see you soon. All right. Yeah. Have a nice one. You bet. Thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye.